Hello, welcome. Good morning, Integrated Math All-Stars. I hope you're having an awesome day. As we move through the year, I will do my best to start these videos off in a classroom setting, no matter where we are. You might notice things that I post up on this imaginary classroom of mine. For example, you now know that I went to Temple University. I've been playing a little bit of piano and occasionally I'll have posters up along the way. But what's the main objective and agenda for today? First, you're gonna see what's expected of you in these videos. We're then gonna take a look at 1.2 examples where the topic is arithmetic sequences. So what exactly is expected of you in these videos for Mr. Cortez's class? Let's take a look. While watching the videos, make sure that you copy down pretty much all of the work. If it's something that I write down and I know what I'm doing, I think, uh, it's important to copy it. It's gonna make your life easy. You won't have to email me with questions asking what the main point was or how I got to this select step because chances are I'm gonna talk about the problems and give you as much detail as I can, as much as you need so that you're successful and when you're successful, I'm pretty happy about that. In addition, if you're not the biggest fan of writing down everything you see, you're totally encouraged to print out an outline of the practice from Blackboard. I'll do my best as we move through the year to make sure that those are posted consistently. So please be on the lookout for them and let me know if I don't post one for some reason. Make sure to pause and rewind. Let's talk about this. And so I say make sure to pause because at some point there might be a lot of material that's on the screen and to make sure that you're getting everything that's copied down, luckily with technology, you can just pause it. I'll stop talking, I'll stop the example, and it's all up to you to kind of catch up. You're also encouraged to rewind if need be in case there was some step along the way that uh, went by too quick or you just need to hear an example completed again these are three things that you should be practicing every time you see a video posted for me so make sure you do them all right so where does that leave us on the agenda just looking at 1.2 examples let's knock these out so i'm going to take a look at some of these some of these are already written out and i'll leave it up to you to read through them and I'm not going to do every problem. Sorry, I'm not going to do your homework. You can practice a little bit. You got this. And of course, I'm here to help you out if you get stuck. But I'll guide you through some of these. Starting first with being given f of n. So I'm actually going to write out how I would pronounce this. f of n. And it's equal to 8n minus 3. And we have g of n, so two different functions, one in blue, one in green, is equal to 3n minus 10. And we're being asked to evaluate the following functions with the indicated values. There's already an example that's done here. So if you want to look at that, you can look back up here, look at that writing. But for this one, I'm just going to go through these problems how I would approach them. So let's color coordinate a little bit. I'll do blue for F functions here and here, and I'll do one G function. So if I'm evaluating F of five, I know that wherever N is, I'm gonna now put, what do you think? Well, in this case, five. Pretty simple, right? Eight times five, what's that gonna get you? Hopefully you're saying 30. Psych, 40. So 40 and then deduct three. Simple, 37, easy. And for G of five, what do you think we're gonna put in place of N up for here? Easy, five. 3 times 5 is 15, 15 minus 10 is 5, simple. I'll give you a moment, you may want to try this last one and then compare and contrast. See what I did, see what you did, see if it matches up. 
that's a good way to check yourself to make sure you know what's going on. Did you pause the video? Did you try this? I hope you did. Here, you should be saying that 8 is going to be multiplying with negative 4. And don't let that stop you just because it's negative. 8 times negative 4 is going to give us negative 32. And then we're deducting 3 more. Notice that we're already negative at negative 32. So don't be afraid to draw a number line if need be. If you're at negative 32 and you deduct three more, you're going back once, twice, three times, it's a negative 35. Sounds good, right? And the next bit, you're gonna be looking for a pattern. Some of these can be challenging, but it's nothing we can't handle. So let's see what's going on here. So we have the first set of terms, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Personally, when I approach these, I always try and look for differences. So I, I'm thinking, all right, well, 2 to 4 is going to add 2. 4 to 8 is going to add 4. 8 to 16 is going to add 8. 16 to 32 is adding 16. Do you see a pattern amongst these numbers? Hopefully you do. It looks as if they keep adding the prerequisite number. So notice you have to start with two, but then you add two to get four. You have four and you add four to get eight. So in this case, what do you think we're gonna be adding to get our sixth value? Hopefully you're saying 32, which gets you the Nintendo number, 64, nice. And as we keep going, we're going to add 64. And what's 64 plus 64? 128. Pretty simple, right? And again, we would add that same bit, add 128, getting you 156. Perfect. I'll leave those other ones up to you to try. And for this set, this is going to be very similar to what we saw in class where we're trying to build upon that step. I'll leave that up to you. With the next bit, the students in a class were asked to find the number of tiles in a figure by describing how they saw the pattern of tiles changing at each step. So this sounds very similar to what we've done. Match each student's way of describing the pattern with the appropriate equation below. Note that S represents the step number and N represents the number of tiles. Cool. So I think what's really nice here is that you can map out what you think these equations are gonna look like. And we've practiced this in class where we're given some type of visual and we try to make some equation, but now we're only given the equation and we're trying to match that with the wording. So we'll try to get one of these set up and I'll leave the other two for you. Uh, let's see what Dan's up to. Dan explained that the middle tower is always the same as the step number. He also pointed out that the two arms on each side of the tower contain one less block than the step number. Okay, so I'm gonna underline what I think is important. So, we're seeing a middle tower is the same as the step number and that the two arms on one side of the tower contain one less block than the step number. So let's try and draw this middle tower. And this is gonna be the step number because it's always the same as the step number. I don't know how many blocks there are. I'm not too curious, but okay. So S is always steady. And he also pointed out that the two arms on each side, so there are two arms. So notice we have one version of S, 
we have two arms in green, and they each contain one less block than the step number. Do you see anything here that only has one version of S and two versions of that other part? One less block than the step number? Hopefully you're saying C. That makes sense to me. I'll leave it up to you to get those other two. Anything else here? No, we're good. And finally with the go. I think that this is probably less enthralling and interesting in comparison to the other two parts, but still important because as we move forward, we're going to be breaking apart numbers as much as we can and trying to rewrite them as much as we can. So this is helpful. So we're being asked to write each expression using an exponent. It's nothing we can't handle. We got this, trust me. So we have what base for 17? What number keeps repeating? Hopefully you're saying six. And is this just one version of six? Is it several versions of six? Maybe if we look at the context, since we're looking at the meaning of an exponent, instead of writing out all six of these, or all sixes, how many sixes are there? Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five. So if we add up one plus one plus one, plus one plus one, that equals five. That's how we can rewrite this as six to the fifth. That one's pretty simple. As far as the expanded form, let's see what that means. So seven to the first power, well, that's just seven on its own, that's easy. Three squared, expanded, how many versions of three do you think there are gonna be? Hopefully you're saying just two. And then what's three times three? Hopefully you're saying nine, which would be the value of the expression. So notice I'm looking at my base. Maybe this might be helpful here on the side is that here I'm saying three is my base, two is my exponent. And that's helpful the meaning of the exponent allows us to rewrite these terms that just keep multiplying by itself over and over and over, and this saves us a lot of trouble. Cool. Uh, let's jump to the parentheses. Some people think that these are intimidating, and in a way they can be, but let's look at this very closely. So closely that I'm even going to zoom in so that we know what we're really doing. Okay, so we have 7 multiplying with two cubed, or two to the third power. So let's expand this. We have seven multiplying with how many versions of two? Hopefully you're saying three. So it could look like that. And it makes sense because it's really just two that's being cubed. Notice that seven is on its own. And this might be helpful to just draw in an imaginary one even though we give respect to it and don't necessarily write it all the time. You could do the same thing here and here. Two times two times two, you can rewrite that as eight. Seven times eight is 56. So this would be the expanded. This would be the value. Anything else intimidating here? Um, well, yeah, let's try 26, why not? So I have 10 on its own, and it's multiplying in parentheses here with eight being squared. So eight times eight. Actually, maybe over here I should have used parentheses, so that's my bad. So really this expanded should look like this. But we soon see that with multiplication, it's the same kind of thing. So 10 times parentheses, eight times eight, so 10 times 64, getting us 640. Boom. 
So notice a slight difference actually with the expanded form. Notice that if we see parentheses around the base and then it's being taken to some exponent, I would rewrite that with parentheses around your base. But if you see two cubed in parentheses, I would just keep everything in house just like that. I hope that this video was helpful. If you have any questions, let me know. Thanks for watching.